Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today for the Securing Our Elections webinar, A State and National Perspective. We have two distinguished guests with us today, and I will introduce them very quickly here before we get started. Today we have uh, Keith Ingram from Texas joining us. He is the president-elect of NACED, which is the National Association of State Elections Directors. Keith is the director for the Elections Division of the Office of the Texas Secretary of State. Uh, Keith practiced law in McAllen in, in Austin, Texas, and in Little Rock, Arkansas. He served from 2008 to 2012 in Governor Perry's Appointments Office, working primarily on judicial appointments. Uh, Keith currently serves as the director of Elections Division for the Texas Secretary of State. Following Keith's presentation, we will have Mr. Jeff Hale, who is the Director of the Election Task Force, a Department of Homeland Security-led interagency charged with coordinating federal support to the election infrastructure community. Jeff is a Certified Information Systems Manager and Experienced Cyber Operations Planner and has supported the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications since 2010. Prior to his service with the Election Task Force, uh, Jeff was the action officer for the department's election infrastructure security mission within the Enterprise Performance Management Office. Thank you both for being here. We're excited about this webinar and all the stuff that you are going to teach us about. Um, and we will take questions via the chat box and address them at the end. So without further ado, uh, we will get started first with Keith. All right, thank you. I appreciate that introduction and uh, the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, making sure I've got control of the screen. Um, I represent uh, the, today the National Association of State Election Directors uh, to tell you a little bit about what the states are doing um, with regard to election security. Um, NASED is the uh, only professional uh, organization for state election directors, and we have members from all 50 states, D.C., and the territories, and uh, we get together twice a year, and you can see that we look like a, a fun-loving group. Um, this is the executive board uh, of NASED, and we met with uh, Homeland Security uh, earlier this year. All right, so we we're talking about uh, cybersecurity in elections. Uh, as you know, in 2016, Arizona and Illinois uh, had a problem with uh, malicious access to their voter registration database. Um, in August of 2016, state chief information officers were notified about potential issues, and uh, Homeland Security uh, uh, Secretary Johnson spoke with state election officials, and uh, it was a rocky beginning to our relationship with Homeland Security. That, that call did not go particularly well uh, because the point of contact for uh, the breaches or suspected breaches in Arizona and Illinois and the targeting of other states uh, was communicated with, you know, the state chief information officer, which is not necessarily um, us, the election officials. Um, and so part of what we've had to do with Homeland Security is, is develop uh, direct lines of communication. Uh, there was the statement about uh, interference that coincidentally was put out at the same time as a uh, video uh, of the incoming or soon to be elected president. And so the warning did not get much play. We had our election, everything went off without a hitch. No votes were uh, messed with on election day. There's been not any evidence at all of election results tampering. Um, in January, Secretary Johnson declared elections as critical infrastructure, a subsector of government infrastructure. Um, and in September, uh, 21 states were notified by the Department of Homeland Security that they were uh, ones actually targeted by uh, the suspect IP addresses from Arizona and Illinois. Um, Texas was one of those, and we were quite surprised to get that news because we had no indication prior to that. And it turns out that what happened was our old IP address for our website, our public-facing website, uh, was scammed. 
Um, the initial meeting of the Election Infrastructure Government Coordinating Council was October 17th. Uh, there had been meetings all throughout uh, 2017 to set up the structure of that Coordinating Council. Um, and the Elections Infrastructure Sector Coordinating Council was uh, formed and met the first time in December of uh, 2017. Um, in between December and March, uh, there was another meeting of the Government Coordinating Council where the election infrastructure ISAC was set up. It is uh, a part of the MS ISAC. Uh, in between there as well, we had a pilot program with uh, I think five states and several local uh, county governments and uh, to, to sort of do a dry run of what the EI ISAC would look like and the products that it would put out. We had a very successful pilot resulting in the EI ISAC being formed. Um, in March of 2018, Congress uh, appropriated the last of the uh, Help America Vote Act money from 2002. Uh, it was $380 million, and it's apportioned to the states based upon uh, the number of registered voters in each state, which means California got the most and Texas got the second most. Ours is about $23.5 million of federal money and about $1.1 million of uh, state match. The EIS Act uh, now has membership from all 50 states, D.C., Guam, Puerto Rico, um, and uh, we're working on uh, some of the territories. More than 1,000 local election offices out of approximately 9,000 um, offices across the state that do elections. I mean, you have to keep in mind, a, a state like Wisconsin runs elections at the township level, and so they have 1,853 uh, election holding entities that are part of that 9,000. Uh, this is the fastest growing uh, sector of all critical infrastructure sectors. Um, and right now, South Carolina, Maryland, Ohio, and Florida all have 100% membership in the EI ISAC with their counties and states. Uh, there are several others that are close behind. Uh, one of the things that several states are doing is they're taking advantage of their state National Guard uh, cybersecurity professionals. Um, and they're doing this in a number of ways. They, they use them for analysis, to run uh, trainings and tabletop exercises, as well as to conduct assessments at the local level and at the state. Um, West Virginia is unique. They have uh, a person from the National Guard assigned to them all the time. And so that, that person is monitoring the network traffic uh, and acting as human eyes on, on their uh, infrastructure. Kentucky and others have used uh, National Guard extensively and assessments at the local level. Obviously, we use uh, our in-state resources. Uh, the Departments of Technology and Chief Information Officers uh, offer many services comparable to Homeland Security. Here in Texas, we've had a close working relationship with uh, our Chief Information Officer, uh, Todd Kimbrell, uh, for a number of years. We've, we've taken advantage of the uh, resources that the Department of Information Resources has uh, to assess our systems and make sure that uh, to do pen testing, um, as well as to help with uh, contract procure procurement. Uh, they've got a very robust procurement uh, platform over there. And once, once something is on the state contract with DIR, it's easier, it's easier for us to access it. And so we uh, have been working with them um, since, I guess, March of this year when the money was appropriated. Uh, and we said, hey, Todd, and then Stacy, his boss, um, we've got this money coming, and we think we want to do these things with it. Uh, can you help us? And they've been very, very helpful. Uh, states are also working with university cybersecurity uh, departments to take advantage of their expertise. Here in Texas, we have leveraged uh, Texas A&M cybersecurity program for background research on uh, best practices and, and what, thing, what people are doing in other states. Uh, before all of this uh, uh, federal money with HAVA, uh, Texas had already passed in its legislative session in 2017 a law that required our office to conduct a study of uh, vulnerabilities in our election systems. Uh, and so we've worked with Texas A&M Cybersecurity uh, Department to make sure that we've got good research and background for all of that. Um, some states are using working groups of uh, county election officials, state election officials, and IT staff uh, to work together to develop guidelines and best practices for their colleagues. Um, the working groups that are currently formed are in Connecticut, Iowa, Rhode Island, Alaska, Pennsylvania, 
and Kentucky. Utah is restricting access to its uh, systems, its statewide voter registration database, and those kind of systems until users have taken cybersecurity training. In addition, uh, we've had at least a dozen states do their own tabletop exercises and, and have statewide training opportunities. Here in Texas, we had a, a county election official seminar in July, and uh, day two was just about exclusively devoted to cybersecurity. Um, we had Homeland Security uh, come to speak, the cyber, the cyber guy for Region 6, as well as the Protective Security Fellow. We had MSISAC and EISAC make presentations, and our goal was to uh, impress upon the counties the seriousness of uh, this uh, as an issue that they need to be aware of, as well as to make sure that they knew about what resources were available to them. We also used day two of our seminar to roll out uh, our program that we're going to do with the counties with the HAVA money um, in Texas. Well, I'll get to that in a minute, but um, anyway, there have been, in addition to the statewide tabletop, and by the way, Colorado is having an epic one today. If you've seen it on Twitter, it's called Epic and it's statewide with all 64 of their counties. Um, and Homeland Security had a, a tabletop uh, for 40 states over three days. And I've been in this job for uh, six years, eight months, and one day. And I never in my wildest dreams thought about having a, a nationwide tabletop exercise on election threats with all kinds of three-letter agencies from the federal government. That's just not something that I envisioned. Um, uh, one thing we need to keep in mind is that as long as there have been elections, there have been attempts to circumvent the results. And so election officials have a good understanding of physical security procedures for the voting equipment itself. Um, you know, we've got built-in logic and accuracy testing of the voting machines. In Texas, we do that before voting starts. We do it immediately before counting starts, and we do it immediately post-counting. Um, obviously, voting machines are dedicated technology, and they're not used for anything else. They're kept under lock and key when they're not in use. They are never connected to the Internet. The computer that programs the, vote, the election onto the voting equipment machines is never connected to the Internet. The computer, the central computer that programs the election uh, and tabulates the results uh, is kept under very strict lock and key with limited access. Uh, a lot of counties don't even allow the janitor to have a key, uh, so it's only the election official in that county who is allowed in that room. Um, the decentralization of election administration over the 9,000 jurisdictions that I mentioned before means that there is not one system that a bad actor can take down or one location for everything. In order to uh, circumvent the vote, they would have to be physically present at a number of election offices, uh, and probably they would have to have Confederates on the inside. Uh, secure physical storage, there's all sorts of chain of custody, uh, seals, locks, um, and then of course we canvass the results, we have recounts, we have uh, all kinds of audits. Here in Texas, we do a partial manual count of 3% of the precincts uh, in one race uh, to confirm the results. Um, as I mentioned, the remaining $380 million of Help America Vote Act funds were appropriated earlier this year. Uh, as of July, 100% of that money has been distributed to the states, which uh, required um, a great deal of effort on the part of the Election Assistance Commission, and we appreciate their help in that regard. Um, and all of the states have given the Election Assistance Commission their narratives and a budget for how they plan to spend the money. Um, the uh, overwhelming uh, thing that it's going to be spent on is uh, elections, enhancing election security at state and local levels. Um, you know, there's also a good chunk that's going to be spent on post-election audits and how to improve those and um, election security uh, of the voter registration database. Here in Texas, uh, we have taken action since 2016 in several regards. We have instituted multi-factor authentication to access the voter registration database. Um, and what the users can do is authenticate their computer for a week. Uh, but if they access the voter registration database after hours, they will have to re-authenticate every time. Uh, we have encrypted our VR data as of last weekend. Uh, so if anybody does a brute force attack on the ser servers themselves, they won't get anything useful. Um, we have installed an Albert sensor on the VR database. 
uh, because our, our VR database is not housed at the state data center where Texas's other Albert sensor is. We have been working closely with Department of Homeland Security on cyber hygiene scans and uh, vulnerability assessments and other uh, all of their uh, suite of services that they have available we are either have done or are working to schedule. Um, and we have been, uh, we've started a program with uh, our Department of Information Resources and Todd Kimbrell uh, to use the federal money uh, to begin assessing county election offices. Our DIR had a managed security service uh, agreement or contract, and so we worked with that vendor to make sure that there was an election specific assessment. And then um, we have got over 100 counties interested in doing it. Uh, we've, we're well down the road with about 25 right now. So we expect to have some of these assessments in before 2018. In addition, we have secured licenses for training materials over the web, uh, and that uh, training has been offered to the county users. And that is all that I have for today, I think. All right. Uh Thank you, Keith, and uh, hello all. Uh, I am Jeff Hale from the Department of Homeland Security. I am the director of our election task force. And uh, briefly, the uh, election task force is an interagency uh, working group uh, that has representation from um, the Election Assistance Commission, the Department of Defense, uh, the intelligence community, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, law enforcement like the FBI uh, and the uh, several components uh, from within the Department of Homeland Security. We are brought together in order to uh, uh, in, in ensure that election uh, officials and the broader stakeholder community uh, has the necessary information to assess risk and then protect themselves from those risks. Um, uh, Keith referenced the timeline uh, of events. Uh, uh, it is uh, accurate to say that DHS uh, stumbled into this space with uh, with the election officials, and we have been working uh, with um, the National Association of Secretaries of State and the National Association of uh, State Election Directors, as well as those at the local level and, and ones like yourself, um, to really learn and uh, and improve this relationship, and it's truly on the uh, the uh, openness and willingness of the election officials to to work with us that the relationship has improved. Uh, in my experience, we are miles from where we were in 2016 uh, in both expectation and understanding across um, the federal and state local community, and uh, we uh, look forward to continuing uh, that progress. Uh, when I refer to our stakeholder group, we consider election officials uh, as one. Uh, Keith referenced the, the Government Coordinating Council. One of the ways we coordinate with election officials is by a representative body uh, of, made up of um, represent representatives from the local level, uh, from the state election director level, uh, and from the Secretary of State level, uh, along with um, NIST, FBI, EAC, and, and ourselves. Um, the, they have been a very active government coordinating council um, and have produced things like uh, communications protocols, which is, um, and uh, new funding guidance for those HAVA funds. Um, the communication protocols are actually one of the, the first and kind of transformative uh, documents where the election sector is really um, leading the way in, in how uh, the federal government can support uh, a community like this. They have helped to define um, what they would like to hear from the Department of Homeland Security and from the FBI and from the intelligence community. Uh, and we, as a federal government, have worked to, um, obviously, uh, in so much as we can, can within our authorities, uh, meet those expectations and come to terms with how we can support. Uh, on the vendor side, they're obviously uh, very important to the um, advancement of risk discussions and the advancement of risk management in this sector. Uh, we are we have formed a similar sector coordinating council. Um, uh, we support them as an executive secretariat, 
they are made up of 26 vendors that include things like election night reporting, um, companies that provide um, cross-state voter registration deconfliction, um, or uh, companies that, uh, that obviously produce uh, uh, poll books, electronic poll books, or voting systems themselves. Um, that is, in its core, what we consider the election infrastructure sector. Um, but there's also the, the uh, necessary interdependencies with, uh, with uh, those like in, in your positions uh, and other state and local uh, government officials. Uh, political campaigns have, and the electorate broadly um, uh, present uh, risk profiles that, that can uh, impact or at least risk transfer into this sector as well. So we try to make concerted efforts uh, to, to integrate and share information across all of these communities. The risks in these sector uh, um, that we're trying to help identify, detect, uh, uh, would be um, an actor pursuing any one of these conclusions uh, or objectives, um, uh, affecting the validity of election results or impacting the availability to vote, or, and this is where we see most of the threat right now, uh, in, in really um, the, the manipulation of the perceptions of the electorate. And there is a space that's, that's more concretely within the election infrastructure community, uh, that is things like uh, trying to impact um, election night reporting, the unofficial reports, uh, the, the reports of unofficial results uh, on uh, election night, um, and then there's the broadly divisive uh, social media initiatives. Um, now we have animation. <laughs> the, uh, as Keith said, uh, in uh, in January 2017, uh, the sec then Secretary Jay Johnson um, uh, established um, election infrastructure as critical infrastructure. Uh, that does not impose any regulations or, or really give the department um, any new authorities. What it does help us to do um, when we are in receipt of uh, numerous requests for technical assistance, um, we are able to justify prioritizing particular um, ones out, out of the, the norm. So versus your, your mom and pop shop wanting us to to perform uh, a risk and vulnerability assessment, why did we choose the the electric company uh, to go before them in 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 the queue, uh, or in this instance, uh, why why are we prioritizing election infrastructure over uh, over others? Uh, it is uh, the establishment of them as critical infrastructure that helps us to do that type of internal prioritization. Um, we also think and we, uh, we hope that um, the critical infrastructure designation helped to recognize this as an issue of national security. Uh, and uh, not only are we prioritize the resources we can, um, uh, we can provide, we have uh, hope that this dialogue has helped to encourage um, states and Congress to continue to, to resource this as, a, as an issue of national security. Um, and this is also uh, afforded us the opportunity to establish those coordination groups that I described earlier uh, and, and allow them to hold uh, national risk management discussions. These are what uh, end up driving the initiatives like the, the national level table, tabletop exercise that Keith referenced, um, which we hope to have on an ongoing basis each year. Now, uh, at the core of what we, what the, why the department is in uh, the election space is our ability to provide cybersecurity services uh, uh, and protective security services. Um, we have field staff. Um, I believe Keith referenced him as a, the, the cyber guy and the, and the physical security or protective security advisor. Um, we have uh, about 150 uh, uh, located across the country right now. Um, and uh, I, as state CIOs, I, I hope you are um, 
well versed with your uh, web, but if that's not the case, uh, I would be happy to connect you with the regional director or the CSA in your uh, in your state. Um, they help to connect you to, to DHS services. They help to connect election officials uh, to um, uh, the, the foundational services that we think we can provide uh, to help them buy down uh, risks. Um, the, the services that we offer are, are, are fairly broad. Um, I've highlighted uh, three on this slide and three on the next that are kind of our, our most popular and and foundational here, uh, the, the top being our cyber hygiene scanning, which is just um, vulnerability scanning of, uh, of internet facing IPs um, at, against a uh, public NIST dat vulnerability database. Um, so nothing proprietary there. Um, we, this is uncredentialed, so uh, it's very light touch. Um, and uh, a lot of states and election officials are already doing something along this line. Uh, what we offer to them is a, a second set of eyes in their broader defense, defense and depth strategy. Um, risk and vulnerability assessments are the, uh, the two-week penetration testing um, that, uh, that what you see on the, the right column is uh, a kind of uh, a la carte um, option that you could select what things you want to focus on. Uh, and then certainly the, the phishing campaign assessments are where we've tried to encourage um, state and local jurisdictions to understand the vulnerabilities presented by uh, the behaviors of individuals. Um, Keith gave rough approximation of the number of, uh, of election jurisdictions. Um, Certainly, we're not anywhere near um, complete in serving these uh, uh, jurisdictions, but that shouldn't be a measure of, of success, really, because of, as Keith mentioned, a lot of what they're doing and a lot of what uh, uh, you all as CIOs are, have already been providing uh, are equivalent to this um, or better. Uh, we just want to be able to make sure that this is available uh, to those who haven't already taken advantage of some other solution. Uh, on this slide, uh, these are more organizational and, and policy-driven assessments, um, uh, understanding your um, kind of uh, cyber resilience posture as uh, according to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, the, the middle one is um, understanding your supply chain dependencies and and other elements. This is one where we've actually found um, election officials to be uh, phenomenally prepared in their ability to operate a, an election under um, a degradation of services of well, electricity or alternate location in a flood. And this is where election officials have truly shined in their uh, continuity of operations planning. Um, and then the, uh, the cyber infrastructure survey is really one um, that just uh, assesses your implementation of, of fairly standard uh, controls. Keith referenced the uh, Election Infrastructure Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Uh, it was officially started in February, as he said. Uh, it has grown to over a thousand members and um, each state is participating. Um, there are multiple levels of participation. Uh, Keith also referenced a, an Albert sensor. That is a NetFlow and intrusion detection sensor that, uh, that, um, that we have previously uh, only provided to, to state CIOs. States could have obviously purchased them uh, for uh, additional services and, and for additional coverage. But in the establishment of the election infrastructure ISAC within the MS ISAC, DHS has funded the deployment of uh, Albert sensors for the to serve uh, the election infrastructure uh, network. Now um, we have more than uh, 38 states um, have confirmed and validated that their election infrastructure is protected by an Albert sensor right now, uh, but half of those have been the either the 
existing architecture or re-architecting uh, their network uh, so that election infrastructure sits behind it. And the other half has been, have been the deployment of new uh, sensors. Some states have also decided to purchase them at the county level. DHS is funding some in the county level, especially for bottom-up states, um, and we continue to deploy those uh, as rapidly as possible. Uh, as I kind of begin to come to a, a close, um, what we've really been focusing on recently is, uh, is outreach to local officials. Um, participation from groups like like Keith's and, and the uh, National Association of State Election Directors and the National Association of Secretaries of State has been phenomenal. Uh, we feel the ability to, to contact and communicate with the right officials uh, in every state uh, but at the state level. Um, uh, we've, we are dependent upon them uh, to help us to communicate at the local level. Um, so we've also been working with, uh, with the state election directors to identify how we could continue to provide value at the local level. So what we have encouraged them to do is sign up for that EII SAC uh, uh, to pursue cyber hygiene scanning or the equivalent and to do a phishing campaign assessment or the equivalent. I know a lot of states do that uh, as well, but um, some of the, the results we've seen are um, uh, in indicative of a need to grow uh, and mature the uh, the cybersecurity awareness in a uh, in a election jurisdictions. Again, this is uh, the kind of a, a concluding slide for me that um, that identifies like what we are really um, where we see the accountability on a uh, on a an election official in this and how we want to help them uh, to ensure they're able to, to do this. Um, with that, I would like to conclude and allow time for questions. Thank you both. Um, that was really interesting. And then Keith, it's good to hear that you've been working with Todd in Texas. Um, and I'm kind of curious if you could speak to some more experience of your members but before we do that, I'd like to remind everyone that we are taking questions via the chat box. So please feel free to type your questions in as we're chatting. Um, so Keith, I know you mentioned you were working with Todd. Um, do, you, do you think that other members of NASED are also working with their CIO? Um, yes, you know, like everything else, there are some states where the relationship is better than other states, but uh, it's my understanding that uh, most of them are consulting with and working closely with their chief information officers. You know, sometimes it's a turf battle, and so you got a CISO and the election official and a CISO at the state, and anyway, mostly. We understand. Yeah, we understand. There are, there are some other um, areas where we kind of have that same similar issue. Um, the question for you, Jeff, you mentioned CSAs and putting state CIOs in touch with those folks. Um, have have a lot of states taken advantage of that, and how are they using that most frequently? I know you met, mentioned um, a few services already. Um, so CSAs, uh, the cybersecurity advisors, uh, perform um, all of the assessments on the second slide, uh, the organizational ones. They also have an additional five other similar organizational policy assessments. Um, they, uh, along with our regional, our other field staff, have um, uh, have held thousands of meetings uh, with um, state uh, and local election officials uh, just to help facilitate the information sharing process. Uh, they understand uh, where they can go to um, uh, to whom they can reach. Uh, for answers when when the U.S. government gets involved and really uh, the objective of the election task force is to ensure um, at some level that if you contact the federal government, we will bring that information to the right places. If you're receiving something that's, that's more appropriate for FBI or DOJ or that would uh, add value.
value to the analysis being done by the intelligence community, uh, we want to be able to, uh, uh, with your authorization, uh, provide it to those. Uh, and similarly, we want to ensure that anything that the FBI has or, or the intelligence community uh, in as much as possible is being pushed down. So we work with the CSAs and the, the RDs and the PSAs, the regional directors and the uh, protective security advisors, to help understand the requirements for information that you all have uh, and then that state and local election officials have um, and, and uh, create that kind of two-way dynamic. Great, thanks for that. I think we have a couple of questions in the queue. Um, we have one question about two-factor authentication, identity management related. I'm, I'm not sure who that is uh, to, so if you could specify, Michael, we'd be happy to ask that. The next question is how practical, and I think this is for, we'd appreciate maybe both of your perspectives on this, maybe first Keith, then Jeff. How practical would it be for states, localities to go back to paper-only voting? National Academy of Sciences called for that this morning. Keith? Um, I have not had a chance to read that paper yet, um, but I don't know. I don't know what paper-only voting means in this context because most of what is used in, across the country today is optical scan ballots if it's paper, and so it's uh, it's read, uh, scanned digitally, and counted electronically. Um, if you mean hand-counted paper ballots, then the feasibility of that is nil. Uh, I don't think that'll ever happen. We need results uh, too quickly on election night, but the feasibility of going from DREs without a paper trail to something that has a paper component is more likely. Uh, like everything else, it just takes money. Uh, here in Texas, it would take quite a bit of money. We spent about $180 million in the first round of HAVA replacing voting equipment, and it would probably take that much again uh, if we were to have to convert to a paper-based system. Yeah, the Jeff, the what are your thoughts? The manner in which I read the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine's report today was uh, that they're looking for an auditable record. Um, and so we still allow for the use of optical scan, um, but uh, if need be, uh, the ability to um, hand count. Uh, and, and I think that's um, ultimately because the, their report also uh, truly advocates for uh, the use of post-election audits um, and risk-limiting audits and that you need the material to be able to do so. Um, thanks for thanks for addressing that. Um, we have another question here. Where does, and I think it's about the mechanics of signing up for the election infrastructure ISAC. Someone asked, uh, Drew asked, where does one sign up for the EI ISAC? Okay, um, there is within the MS ISAC, uh, uh, so um, there are, it's in a couple of locations in my slides, um, but they're within the Center for Internet Security uh, is their parent organization for both of these. Uh, and then when signing up, uh, they've uh, established a um, kind of do domain of interest that you could click through uh, and ensure you're in receipt of that information. Um, so far, there has been um, mostly common information between the, the, the broader MSISEC information and then the uh, specific EIISEC, uh, and I expect that to continue. That's why we fund it from the same place. Um, but the, the uh, most uh, the like uh, uh, the the most specific um, uh, EI ISAC information is more about um, foundational practices for securing voter registration databases and the type of uh, content and analysis there, as opposed to indicators. Uh, my slide ten is one of the places where you can uh, see the link to get more information. Yeah, and Thanks, I just Googled PI-ISAC, and uh, the first hit was the membership application page. Thanks, Keith. 
Another question we have, and I think this is for Keith, are most states releasing all of their funds to the individual election authorities? Our state is using a portion as required by state law for cyber. Um, it's going to be it's going to be different in every state. You can go to eac.gov and uh, and look at the narratives and the budgets and see how they're going to do it. Here in Texas, we decided that it was not enough money to do a grant program and let the the counties have a menu of options. So we we secured this managed security service uh, assessments through our Department of Information Resources and told the counties this is what you can do. That's going to use about seven million dollars of the money if everybody takes us up on it. And we're going to use a couple of million at the state level for uh, enhancements of our voter registration security. Um, and then the rest of it will be for remediation based upon what the assessments find. Uh, we expect that the counties are going to partner with us on the remediation effort. And so we'll make those dollars go further. And Keith, do you have any idea how some of the other states might be spending their funds just generally? I know um, on the EAC site, they did do a broad rundown of how states are using that. I think over 35% is that on, is spent on cyber. What are your thoughts? Um, I, I think it's going to be similar. Uh, you know, obviously the, the amounts are different because the states are different sizes. But Illinois has got this uh, program where every county is going to get, uh, uh, what do they call it, a cybersecurity advisor. Um, and they're going to do the same kind of thing that we're doing with the assessment. So they're going to identify uh, anything that needs to be corrected and, and give them a path for correcting it. Uh, in New Jersey, they're using their state homeland security for the same thing and, and funding it with this money. You know, so a lot of the effort is to make sure that the counties are doing what they're supposed to be doing at the local level. Um, you know, the, if you think about election infrastructure, it's really about four different main categories. There's the election equipment itself and the computer that programs those. Those are all going to be at the local level. Uh, some states are top down like Maryland or North Carolina where they control what the counties use, but, but the stuff is still housed at the local level. Uh, and then you got the voter registration database, uh, which is usually going to be uh, connected to the internet and uh, more vulnerable. Um, and then you've got the candidate management election night returns piece so that if somebody messes with that, then you know, it makes the voters worry about the integrity of the election, even though the votes themselves haven't been messed with. And then you've got public facing websites. So it's all of those different components. The most, um, you know, like I said, the most vulnerable piece is probably the voter registration database. The piece that people worry about the most is the election equipment itself. And so we need to make sure with this federal money, and I think the states are doing that, that, that both of those things are secure. The voter registration data, as well as that the counties are, are taking good measures to protect the equipment at, at the local level. Thanks, Keith. And I think one general question that I think we might have, um, and I think you would be good to answer this, is how would you how would you address those concerns that we hear about where, you know, those broader concerns of, well, the, our elections are being hacked and voter machine, um, malicious kind of hacking and and altering votes and those types of comments, how would you address that? And what do you say when you hear those types of things? Um, the first thing that we emphasize is that the equipment is never connected to the internet. It would require physical presence to, to mess with. Um, that seems to allay most people's concerns whenever they call the question. The problem is that a lot of the news stories on what happened in 2016 and the and the concerns expressed since ball together all four of those things that I mentioned. So they treat election night reporting websites as synonymous with the votes, and and it's just not. You know, the votes are in a separate system in another room. It's just the reporting of the results at the election night return website. So I saw that Politico article after DefCon where a 17 year old says, I, I hacked an election and I, and I'm not even a very good hacker, and that that whole story was just soup to nuts wrong. It just, it didn't affect the actual election at all. It just affected the reporting of it. And so I think a lot of, a lot of what we spend time doing here is disentangling the different things that people are talking about. And if, if, you know, we're trying to cultivate um, 
a local reporting cadre here in Austin that understands the difference between a website scan, a VR penetration, and an election system. You know, if you if you can get a reporter to understand the differences between those, then the reporting gets a lot better. Thanks. I think that's probably the you know most most frequently asked question that we get to. And of course, I think some of us understand that, but it's good to hear that you say you say that too. Jeff, would you have any comments to that? Yeah, I mean, we we see this uh, quite frequently as well, and and the way we characterize. Uh, DEFCON was um, generous in that article out, uh, out of DEFCON. Uh, not only that, that it was, um, that even the way that it was described that would have been on election night reporting, but what was uh, contrived there was um, these were basically digital obstacle courses and in no way actually mock-ups of the protections of the of a voter registration database or an election night reporting system. Uh, and so we try to um, work to amplify the, the honest brokers in this space. And we see that um, a lot of the, the members and the leadership of, uh, of uh, the National Association of Secretaries of State and the National Association of State Election Directors um, are, are put in a position to um, represent their, their respective communities uh, and help to dispel dis disinformation. We also think that while this is a, a, a challenge now, when it comes down to uh, a more operational election environment, um, reporters need to know to whom they can turn uh, on uh, misinformation about uh, the availability of polling places or uh, things that we saw in 2016 that said, um, just text to vote, or uh, or yeah, uh, late voting exists. Um, so th this is where we're trying to uh, also help the media uh, and also and social media companies uh, have the connective tissue with uh, honest brokers of information in the election infrastructure space, uh, like Keith and his peers. Wonderful. Thank you both for addressing that. Um, I know that's something that you guys have to address probably pretty frequently. So um, thank you for doing that. So on, I think we don't, we don't have any more questions. In, oh, we're getting another question in the queue, but before we get to that, let me get to that real quick. Um, regarding two, the question in two-factor authentication and identity, I think this, this question is how does two-factor authentication authentication and identity access management plays in your um, in your sphere. Keith, I think you kind of mentioned that before. Could you address that again? I'm sure. You know, the the like I mentioned, the voter registration database and the voter registration data itself is what we worry about uh, probably the most from a cybersecurity perspective. And we in Texas especially, but most states don't really have control over the endpoint. So we don't know anything about that computer that's accessing our system and, and what's on it and what it's been exposed to. So we have tried to mitigate the risk involved with that by instituting two-factor authentication. Uh, you know, some states are doing it with a, with a card, you know, that generates the random number uh, on the spot. Some doing with key fobs. We're not. We're using cell phones. Uh, and, you know, it, I don't know if it would be better to have another thing to keep up with or not. But in the meantime, as part of our uh, vulnerability report to the legislature that we've got to do, uh, we have been investigating uh, using uh, virtual desktops or a thin clients uh, to access our system and, and requiring that anybody that access our system go through those as well as do the multi-factor authentication. Obviously, that'll be an investment that'll be a, an ongoing uh, investment. But if the legislature wants to do it, that's probably the most secure way to to fix our endpoint problem. Wonderful. So on a concluding note, um, I think Keith, I wanted to ask you, what can state CI CIOs do to help you achieve your mission? How can we be helpful to you? Um, you know, I, the model here in Texas, where we've had a very good partnership with with our CIO and and CISO. Um, you know, I, I knew who they were, and we had worked together before 2016, uh, which helped, uh, you know, when our relationship had to grow closer. But 
make sure that that the election officials in your state know that that you're available and that you have resources available to them. Uh, if you haven't, uh, you know, in the past, then then start now uh, because it it can be a very valuable partnership from the contracting to the cyber hygiene to to the pen testing and assessments. I mean, our DIR has been phenomenal and uh, just a great partner. Well, I know Todd really appreciates that. Um, we don't have any more questions uh, for you, our speakers, and thank you for everyone for, to, for joining today. We will make the slides available as well as the recording. Keith, Jeff, thank you so much for your participation today. We really appreciate it and learned a lot from the conversation. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This concludes the call. Thank you, everyone.